Welcome back to My Seminary Life. I'm your host, Brandon Knight, and on behalf of everybody in this studio right now, happy Hanukkah to you all listening. Uh, there's, If you're listening to this episode on Saturday night when this episode comes out, there's a really good chance that my wife and I are sitting down right now to light our menorah to commemorate the third night of Hanukkah. And I decided, because I get to pick the episodes, that... I wanted to bring you all in a little bit on the holiday festivities, uh, some of the, a little bit, one little bit of the traditions that we have when it comes to celebrating Hanukkah. Uh, specifically, one of the best, if I'm being quite honest, uh, one of the best Hanukkah movies out there, some holiday content for you all. This is the Disney Channel original movie, Full Court Miracle. And to help me review this movie today, to walk through it, uh, I've brought back my brother Bradley because he now has gone two for two on reviewing movies that we grew up watching together. Um, So Bradley, welcome back to the show. Happy Hanukkah and also congratulations on your recent engagement. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I just want to note that it's kind of funny the range that you've had me do on the show. (laughs) First, we went from uh, worship and the struggle of ministry um, and what is worship to recess schools out. And now here we are with Full Court Miracle, a tradition in our family. We'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, thank you for congratulating me. Uh, Been a very exciting time for the engagement. It has been quite the range, and actually, after this episode, there's another one I want to discuss with you. And actually, we're going to come full circle. We're coming. We're coming back to worship now. A little bit more serious. Um, but yeah, so we're here today to talk about the the Hanukkah movie, Full Court Miracle, Disney Channel original movie, 20th anniversary. This movie came out 20 years ago. I was nine. That would have made you 20 years ago. I would have been four. That's what I thought. Yeah. Four years old. That place is Claire at like right around eight or something. So this is just for all of you slightly older people listening to the show, just to help all of us feel slightly older. But I want to start off here talking about something that Bradley and I know for a fact, and I'm sure those of you listening know as well, that when it comes to this time of the year, there's too much to watch. Everybody has like their favorite things that you have to watch Christmas movie wise every year. You know, I will always choose a Christmas story over the Polar Express. Honestly, I'll probably choose a lot of things over the Polar Express. Um, But there's there's almost too much. There truly is too much. And there's always more Christmas content when it comes to Hanukkah. Complete opposite story. There's not a lot. There's not much by way of Hanukkah content. There's this movie, which is technically a TV movie. There's a handful of like Hallmark Christmas or Hallmark Hanukkah Christmas movie kind of things. There's Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights, a really good Rugrats Hanukkah special, which we might have to run it back on that one at some point. And also then there's just like, this is a Christmas special and that guy over there is the one random Jewish character for a Hanukkah. So Bradley, there's not a lot of Hanukkah content out there. Do you have any, do you have any comments on this before we move any further? You know what? Um, Maybe it's because we were raised in a Disney house, but um, my two favorite Hanukkah specials are this one and then the even Stevens Hanukkah special. Um, Just a classic one. It's too bad we're not talking about that today. But yeah, I guess I never really have done any research to see what type of stuff is out there. But you're right. It tends to be that um, this character is also Jewish and they can't come to your Christmas celebration because they're celebrating Hanukkah. Oh, and by the way, this character is celebrating Kwanzaa a little bit, you know? So just like that. Maybe that's because of the audience that's watching the TV show isn't celebrating Hanukkah. But yeah, I can't wait to dive right into this. Yeah, you see examples like the one of the Lizzie McGuire Hanuk- er, Christmas specials. There's a quick reference to the fact that Gordo is celebrating Hanukkah and all he gets this time of the year is latkes or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think. Arthur, Arthur there's, a, there's a quick one for Arthur. There's a quick one in Kim Possible. Yeah, uh, yeah there's just a lot of... And you're right also with the Kwanzaa. You know, that's another one that's like, and this person does Kwanzaa. Really, the Arthur special yeah. is basically just, here's a bunch of other holiday traditions. Right. 
Yeah. So my question, though, I was kind of surprised as I was reading and looking at these uh, different Hanukkah specials out there just to see if I was missing one because I, I wouldn't mind watching more. I was kind of surprised to find out that there is not. No one has ever made like a legit um, like serious war movie judah and the maccabees taking back jerusalem from antiochus like there's not one no one has done that yet to make like a serious film of this so my question for you is if you were in charge of putting that movie together who do you want directing it well there's one that comes straight to my mind and that's kind of the stereotypical answer. But I also have two other answers. So the stereotypical answer, the one that I'm going to go with is Zack Schneider. Obviously, you think of the Maccabees and 300. They just go together. However, however, it depends on how you want to tell the story. Um, I think the team behind The Chosen, the Angel Studios, they do a really good job of making movies that have biblical backgrounds, but not necessarily are the stereotypical Christian films that are cheesy. I keep seeing advertisements for this one right now called The Shift, and uh, it's a guy who loses everything, this devil character, which you don't really notice he's the devil until you really watch the trailer, but it's the story of Job, and uh, you don't really get those backgrounds of Maybe it's bad, but as a Christian, you don't necessarily get those Christian overtones that you would in a normal Christian trailer. Like, oh, I lost everything, the shining light on the Bible, like in Bible Man or something, you know? Um, The other one I was thinking of, um, the third director, like I said, it just depends on the direction you want to go. If you want to do like a more historical background accurate one, I was thinking of the woman who did Zero Dark Thirty. Um, She, her name, I think it's Catherine Bigelow. There was two different takes when that story came out. And Zero Dark Thirty is the more like historical version. Um, And right at the end is when they show them go get Osama bin Laden. The other version, it's like the entire thing is action. So I guess it just depends on the story that you want to tell. Um, Obviously, you two reacted the way I thought you would when I said Zack Schneider because you just think violence and gore and, you know, war. Go ahead. Well, I... I responded because I, I knew you were going to say Zack Snyder because you, you do like Zack Snyder. And actually, uh, back a couple months ago when Christian Ashley and I reviewed 300, we talked a little bit about uh, about Zack Snyder just in general. Um, and you are you are right when it comes to, to Snyder that like I think of his cut of Justice League or you said 300 or Watchmen as like examples of like when he's on and when he when he's on and when he wants to be artistic without being like ironic he can be artistically ironic Army of the Dead is an example of him being like ironic and funny Um, but no he could he could do that I like the chosen pick the Angel Studios that's a good call I was not thinking of the woman who did zero dark 30, but that would be interesting. So my picks, um, similar to you, I had two picks right off the bat that I was like, it would look cool, but I don't know if it would be, I don't know if they're right. Peter Jackson. Yeah. It would look cool. Mm -hmm. As much as I love the Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson has kind of shown that that was, that was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was. The, I guess Tintin was pretty good too, yeah. um, but like that's his well, best Spielberg work. Well, we'll get there. Um, the other person that was like artistically, it would look good, but I don't think he would do it. Clint Eastwood, oh. I think that like because he does gritty films yeah. and it they kind of has that like black and white muted color type of thing. Um, but the person that I was gonna pick of like no, that's who I want to direct it is Spielberg, mm. um, because. Spielberg has done, either directed or produced, a number of World War II era films, yeah. like biopics. And obviously, there's a big difference between World War II and like 500 BC or exactly whenever exactly the war happened. But I think he has shown that he would be good at that kind of a that kind of a storytelling of like something true story inspired events similar to the movie that we're going to talk about today actually based on a true story any responses to my picks for directors 
No, I think they are really good. Um, I also thought of Peter Jackson, but I knew you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> the other other one that just popped into my head, and I was trying to search it really quick, but unfortunately, uh, I couldn't find the director off the top of my search. Was 1917 it was a good one shot straight through, and I feel like when you look back at those um, older Christian films, like The Ten Commandments, there's times when there is like uh, scenes that are cut, you know. Like here's an act end, but uh, most of the time they just feel like straight through and they kind of go on and on and on. So I forgot who the director is, but 1917's director would be good. But yeah, Spielsberg, we're taking two different takes, Spielsberg, Snyder, but either way, you're going to end up with a good movie. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You're going to get a good movie. And honestly, if there's going to be any Christian people doing this movie, I would want Angel Studios. This very hypothetical movie. I do not want what's his face who did Fireproof and all of those movies. The courageous guy. I don't. I don't want that guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And can we get Kevin Sorbo in the film too, please? Um, let's talk about Full Court Miracle. So, as I mentioned, this is the twentieth anniversary of this movie. It came out in November on November twenty first, two thousand and three. So we're just past twentieth anniversary of it now. Uh, it is a like I said, it's a decom Disney Channel original movie. Uh, for those of you who have not watched this in twenty years, or maybe you did not have people in your household watching decoms in oh three, uh, it is streaming on Disney Plus. So if you have Disney Plus, you can definitely check it out there. Uh, after this episode uh, finishes up 90 minutes long like on the dot it's the perfect length of a movie this movie is directed by Stuart Gillard who fun fact in 1993 directed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 what? <laughs> yeah that's the one with I think that's the one with Kevin Nash as Super Shredder uh-huh. uh, he directed that interesting cast of people here we got Alex Linz as Alex Schlotsky he's the main The main character, the main boy, the designated Disney Channel kid who's really into a thing that his parents are not into, which is the plot of a lot of these movies. Uh, Linz went on to also play uh, the lead in Max Keeble's Big Move, another movie none of us have watched in 20 years, but now you're going to go check it out. Richard T. Jones plays Lamont Carr, who we'll talk about here in a moment. Like I said, this is a biopic, and it centers around him. He's currently on ABC's The Rookie. He's one of the main characters over there. I did not know that because I don't watch that show. Uh, we also have... Oh, wait. oh, oh, you got something for me? He was in Godzilla. Oh. He was an army man in Godzilla. He was an officer, and every time I watch it, I'm like, oh my gosh, Judah Maccabee, he's going to fight Godzilla. That's amazing. Let's get more of that. Uh, We have Sean Marquette as Ben Schwartz. Uh, He went on to do a lot of voice acting, including Mac from Foster's Home from Imaginary Friends. And last but certainly not least, especially for Bradley, we have Eric Noonson as TJ Murphy. Um, All of you horror fans out there would know him as Donnie Wahlberg's kid in Saw 2. But for Bradley... Uh, he plays, uh, Eric Nudson plays Crash of Crash and the Boys in Edgar Wright's Scott Pilgrim versus the World, starring Michael Sarah and literally everybody else on the planet. Uh, this movie is stacked. And the reason I say all that is because is this, is Scott Pilgrim versus the World your favorite movie? Yes. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Um, is the, uh, how's the cartoon treating you so far? So I'm four episodes in, halfway through the season. It's completely different than the books and the movie. It took a very big turn that I was surprised by, but I've really enjoyed it. Um, I wouldn't have liked it if the original writer, Brian Lee O'Malley, wasn't attached to it. I think they would have just been ripping up the lore, but he's actually heavily involved. So it's cool to see that, that they're expanding uh, all the characters. And it's cool to hear all the original voice actors or the original actors come back to play the voices. That is, well, I haven't started it yet, but that is one of the best parts, I would say, is the fact that they have just about everybody back. That's really cool. And that shows, I mean, you're talking like Chris Evans, you know, this is like Brie Larson, like people who have gone on to have big careers. And that shows just like how central this movie is for them in their career of like, yeah, I'll come back and do the voice for this for Netflix. It's Netflix. I'm sure they're throwing a ton of cash at them too, but... So those are my, uh, a little bit of fun facts, a little bit about uh, some of the characters in this movie. Bradley, when it comes to Disney Channel original movies, 
where would you rank Full Court Miracle? You know, either on a scale of one to ten, or if you can kind of ballpark it, where would this one be at for you? Well, on a scale of one to ten, I'd probably give it an eight. Um, I would say a nine, but that's kind of just like the heartfelt, uh, this has always been in my life, but I'll say an eight because uh, they do a really good job for Disney not to take any sort of religious stance. They do a really good job uh, teaching what Hanukkah is and just like what the Jewish people believe. Um, So probably an eight. In my rankings of all time Disney Channel original movies, I'm not for sure. At least top 15. (laughs) There's so many, but at least top 15. I think if I sat down, I would agree with the number ranking first off. It's like an eight. Um, If I sat down and ranked them out, honestly, it could make like, it would make top five, maybe top three, if I'm being honest. And I think part of it is the fact of like, I've been watching this movie for 20 years. Like, (laughs) you're just going to gravitate towards it, you know? I've also, another one I would put in there, which is another one I've watched on repeat year after year, is Luck of the Irish. Like, that would be another one that's pretty high up there for me as well. Take us through this movie, Bradley, kind of at a high level. What are we dealing with here exactly? So, this movie is loosely based on a true story of Lamont Carr. He is a basketball player who got hurt. Right before he got drafted, I believe. Right before he got drafted, he got hurt. And now he's trying to find money to meet ends. And in the story that is being portrayed here, um, we have a school of students playing basketball, and they suck. They're the Lions. (laughs) They're garbage. But the state tournament is going to be held at their school this year for some reason, even though they suck. And they want to be good. So they're looking around, and it's Hanukkah time, and they got to find their Judah Maccabee. And I don't know if you want to explain what that term means, but who is Judah Maccabee? So in the story of Hanukkah, um, the short version is uh, Alexander the Great conquers everything and institutes what we know, in, we know now as Hellenization. Everybody has to be Greek. This is very different from how a lot of other eastern or uh how a lot of the other like middle eastern countries would have conquered like persia was like dude just pay your taxes and don't start any wars and you could do whatever you want um but greece was like no you're gonna worship our gods eat our food dress like we do and that's fine unless you're the jewish people who are like no this is like part of our religious identity this is how we worship yahweh we dress cer- we you know we wear certain kinds of clothing we don't eat certain foods we only worship one god um and so this caused a whole big issue and Judah's father, who was a priest, uh, basically declared, look, whoever is faithful in Israel, follow me. We're taking back Jerusalem. Um, in the meantime, Antiochus, as you say in Hebrew, or Antiochus, if you go with the Greek pronunciation, he like desecrates the temple just brings it down it doesn't like destroy it but just like makes it unholy slaughtering animals in the holy places and all that um but matthias judah's dad puts together basically a militia um and his son judah rises up to be basically the guy in charge um the maccabees which is the hammer Judah Maccabee was his nickname, was kind of a nickname kind of thing, not like his last name, Judah the Hammer. And the group of men following him were the Maccabees. So basically, bringing it back now to the movie, what you have here is these terrible basketball players, which as somebody who played on a terrible basketball team in middle school, I really connected with these kids (laughs) at one point. Um, And the obnoxious other school, that was Hammond Baptist. I will name who it was. Um, (laughs) I will name it. Um, I... uh, so they're directionless. This is one thing that you see really early on is that this not only is this team terrible, they're coaches too. He doesn't care. He's like the math teacher or something yeah. like that. And that's what that's what he knows. He doesn't know he doesn't know basketball. They just had to have a coach. And when they when Schlotsky meets Lamont Carr, they are like we found our Judah Maccabee. And there are like these little things that are put in there. I don't know where the creative liberties start and end with this story. Um, But there are some things that are put in there of like, he has the same amount of brothers as Judah Maccabee and his dad had a similar name. So his number, his Jersey number was a reference to. So it's like, 
like at one point early in the movie, they're like, we found the ghost of Judah Maccabee. And he's this like six foot black man playing street ball in Philadelphia. And he, we're going to make him be our new coach. Yes. But opposition arises. Not only do they face him and Baptist, but, <laughs> but there's a lot that comes in their way. First of all, they have to figure out how they're going to pay Lamont. And Alex, who loves basketball, who, like you said, their current coach is a math teacher. He pretty much coaches the team himself, Alex does. Um, he's got to figure out how to get money to do this. So they do all sorts of things. First of all, let's point out the fact that Lamont loves exploiting this child for his money. <laughs> but anyway, so um, Alex has to sell a very famous basketball player's uh, rookie card. And it's a gift that he got. And uh, he sells it for a lot of money. That way, uh, Lamont can be uh, be paid to do this. They only uh, practice in the nearby neighborhood because they can't practice on school grounds. Uh, other opposition they face, the school, um, not the principal, but uh, I lost her name. Uh, the school lady. It was the principal. So there was the principal lady. Then, because it's a Hebrew school, there's also a rabbi, right. and then Schlotsky's mom, who's like kind of the third or third like per like grown up in charge. She's like the head of the school board or PTA or something like that. The rabbi is like the one guy who's like, no, we should do this. This is a good idea. It's the mom and the the principal who's like pu- pushing back because, like I said earlier, I'll just make do this real quick uh this does follow one of the popular disney channel original movie plot lines we see it in halloween town we see it in eddie's million dollar cook off cook off of that the main kid has a hobby that the parent doesn't want them to have and that causes tension in the relationship only later for the parent to say you know what you can have your other hobby. I'm fine with that. And we see that with Schlotsky and his mom in this movie. Yes, his mom wants him. They're in middle school, I believe. His mom wants him to start going to internships to become a doctor. And all Alex wants to do is dribble a ball. All right? So that's the opposition they run into with his mom. For good reason. She wants him to have a good future. However, he's only in sixth grade, I think, or something like that. So he doesn't have to figure out his entire life, and that's what the dad is trying to get across. Maybe he's not going to get drafted by the NBA, but let him dream a little bit. So um, since his mom wants him to go, there's a lot of opposition in this movie. Since his mom wants him to go to this class, he's got to sneak his way around that to go practice for basketball with Lamont. And he gets his best friend to do it because, you know what, she's smart, and she's going to work on her future. So she goes ahead and does it. Um, in addition, finally, after a long meal at the family, everybody's invited over for a family meal (laughs) and the priest decides, you know what, we're going to do this. He can't teach these kids without being on school grounds. So they give Lamont a job. Um, and I don't know after I'm done, if you want to explain why Lamont needs money and what's he's doing, but, um, they get Lamont a job and they're focused on basketball. They're doing good. They're training, they're practicing. All of a sudden the priest is the assistant coach. He's got the Judah Maccabee moves. And you know what comes out of this? The final opposition. Well, the second to last opposition, cause that's not the climax of the film. The second to last opposition is that Alex sucks at history. <laughs> So he has to learn how to study and he's kicked off of the team for a brief moment because if he can't pass, then he can't play, which is actually a very good thing that Lamont has taught him. So what does he do? He pretends to dribble a ball because that's how he studied. Anyway, let's back up a little bit. Why does Lamont exploit this kids for his money? Exploits a little strong, but yeah, because he does, he's like, I don't want to take your money, kid. But then he was like insistent. I think it was a, oh, I'm trying to remember who the basketball player was now that he sold the rookie card to get. He like, it was like a gift from his bar mitzvah. It was Dr. J. Yeah, you're right. It was Dr. J. Um, But basically, like you said, Lamont got hurt before getting drafted or had just gotten drafted and got hurt. So he was not playing, but he was waiting on a call from the 76ers because basketball, one of the few cool things about it, in my opinion, I don't really care that much for basketball, but I do like how some 
teams will do the seven day contract thing where like, okay, we'll just give you a trial run. You could sit the bench, get a little bit of playing time. We could talk more later. And basically what that's what he's waiting on. In the meantime, his high school sweetheart and their child is in, I think they're in Virginia because he went to the university of Virginia. So he's, he's like trying to figure out ways to make some money, not for himself, but to send back to his family while he waits for the Sixers to give him a chance to play. Um, so in the meantime, he's just living out of his van, which is also a piece of junk. There's a lot of junk in this movie. Uh, there's, which is just a piece of junk, and he's just living in his van under an overpass. And eventually, Schlotsky figures that out, and they have to kind of. That was another thing they have to kind of work around because if he's going to be working for the school, they need a place of residence. So that turns into a whole thing as well but but yeah so there was a purpose it's not like lamont was like some shady guy sure, just yeah. taking some kids oh, money sure. but uh you did also you didn't you didn't mess- mention one of the other great scenes of the kids they take their parents espresso espresso machine to like make cappuccinos to sell outside of the school or something which was a pretty funny scene because it like breaks and stuff yes Yes, yeah, so like you said, exploit's a strong term. But um, we're going to fast forward. We're getting towards the end of the movie. The uh, Lions have a great training scene. It's my favorite scene. Um, he teaches them all different things. You got to be defense. You got to be the butt, baby. You got to be six man. You got to get angry and foul, pe- and foul out. That's your job. You have to learn the hook shot. Um, Slosky has to pass the ball because he hogs it. I mean, as the coach... And as the main player, I understand he's got to be scoring all the points, but now you have a coach. So um, they get better. They're in the finals. They're in the final tournament. And all of a sudden, Lamont gets his contract, and he's got to go play, and he has to leave the team. So they're back to their math teacher as their coach. And then in their final game, they face – we probably should have really looked up who these people are. I'm just going to keep calling them HB. Do you remember the name of the team? Uh I don't remember the name of the team exactly, uh, but I do remember that all of this takes place in Philadelphia. I don't know if we said that, which you do get a cool, quick little history lesson on the early days of the in, of the NBA at one point and how a lot of the early teams were founded and uh, were players of Jewish nationality. Um, I don't remember, but I do remember they're Gentiles. They are Gentiles. This is like a very specific like plot the d- device for what's coming up here in a moment where we kind of circle back more towards the Hanukkah end of things. Um, so no, I don't remember their team name, but they're a bunch of gringos and they're not they're not nice guys. They're not nice guys. Yes. So they're uh, going back and forth. They're actually a really good team now. And all of a sudden... Uh, I think they're down by, um, I don't know, let's just say 12 points. I can't remember. They're down by a lot, and the generator's starting to run out of power. We don't know why, other than there's a bad storm that night. And as it turns out, Lamont also can't make it to his tryout. What is he going to do? So um, the generator's running poorly. The coach, who's the math teacher, actually does his job and figures out there's only a little bit of amount of oil left, just like the story of Hanukkah. Yeah, so this is where it circles back to the story of Hanukkah. So eventually, Judah, Ma- Judah and the Maccabees, they take back Jerusalem from Antiochus. They get to the temple, and like I said, it's ransacked, it's de- desecrated. And worst of all, the menorah is running out of oil. Now, from a very modern standpoint, the fact that the thing that provides light for the building seems like a pretty small detail to... The greater, like, there's pig's guts laying around. Like, come on, Judah, let's clean this up. But this is the second temple. So Solomon's temple is long gone. The Ark of the Covenant is destroyed, lost to history, sitting in someone's basement somewhere in the Middle East. I don't know. Nobody really knows. Um, And so what has taken its place as the representation of God's presence in the temple during the second temple period is is a very specific menorah. These are just candlesticks, candelabras that were used to light the temple. But there was one very specific one that was supposed to be like an eternal flame, always burning, representing the presence of God. And this thing is damaged and just about out of oil. 
And the miracle of Hanukkah and why this is celebrated for eight nights is that that was how long it was going to take before they were going to get more oil. I think it was like how long it was going to like literally how long it was going to take for them to make more. And it stayed burning all eight nights until they were able to get more oil. That is the miracle aspect of it. And it's more than just like this. I think in a lot of the, in the few media that we have, it does become this story of miracles, right? It's a miracle. It's the miracle. It's the festival of lights, the miracle of lights. But what's really cool when you like stop to reflect on it. And one of the reasons why we as Christians can maybe have a moment to relate to this story is that this is a really dark period in the, in the history of Jerusalem, in the history of Israel, where, this is the intertestamental period. God has stopped speaking. There's no prophets anymore. Uh, Jesus and John the Baptist, they're still like hundreds of years away. And your n- national and religious identity has been stripped away from you. Your temple is ransacked. And the one thing you have left to remind you of the fact that God has not abandoned you looks like it's about ready to go out. And it keeps going. And that's... Like, as cool as it is to celebrate the miracle aspect of it, and we should because God works miracles, <clears throat> but the the big thing about this story is that God does not abandon his people, and that's what we see here in the story, and this is what comes, bringing it back to full court miracle, this is what's going to happen. Maybe not so much the whole God doesn't abandon his people part, but the generator runs out of oil. And all of the power kicks back on. Like, it's perfectly fine. No emergency lights, no nothing. Like, everything's back up. And everyone's, like, dumbfounded. Like, how does this... Okay, I guess we're going to finish playing this game now. And spoiler alert for a 20-year-old movie. The the little, the little sucky team from Philadelphia comes back. And they win the tournament. And they all live happily ever after. Yeah, and if we back it up just a little bit, um, the power is going out, the generator is running out of fuel, um, and the kids are still trying to play through it. They know as much time as they have left, um, and they end up getting it down to uh, a couple points, maybe like one or two points, I can't remember exactly. And the terrible team that they're facing calls timeout, and they're going to run the clock down until the generator runs out of power. Meanwhile... Go ahead. Which, by the way, would have taken a, approximately like seven timeouts in order for that to work. Like they called one 30 second timeout and then just stood there for like three minutes in order for it to run out. So meanwhile, um, Slosky's mom is going to go find Lamont and uh, she does. And Lamont comes just in time, just like Judah Maccabee does. And... Uh, the team is sad because they're about to lose. The generator runs out of fuel and he's like, what's up my dogs, which we didn't mention. That's a great scene too. He makes them bark like dogs anyway. So he's like, what's up my dogs. And they're all sad. We'd lost. And then he's like, that's not true. There's still time on the clock. And, uh, the generator, like you said, it kicks back on and they get all fired up. They win the game. Everybody's happy. You get a voiceover from the priest about how this connects to Judah Maccabee. Um, Schlotsky's mom accepts that, hey, maybe he's just in middle school and he could play basketball for a little bit. She also was able to find Lamont's family and they all come together happily ever after. Uh, Lamont is going to continue to coach at the school. And it's just a good, fun story. You know, like you said at the beginning of this episode, 90 minutes is the movie. And like I also said, it's kind of, there's not a lot of information out there on where the the true story starts and ends. My assumption is that all of the Hanukkah stuff is like manufactured for the movie per, for the purpose of the film. But the real Lamont car was a real basketball player for the University of Virginia. Um, I don't remember if he actually ever played in the NBA, but at one point in his career, he took on a... Uh, Hebrew school in Philadelphia. I think it was a high school that wasn't very good and turned the team into like 
state champions, regional champions, something like that. So there is some truth that, you know, it's a biopic. Um, so there are some creative liberties in, within this film, but this is, you know, we do see this like underdog story still of, and everyone likes a good underdog story. Looking overall at this film, you mentioned one already of your favorite scenes in this movie. Are there any other scenes, lines, whatever that you're like, love that part? Yeah. So like I said, the training scene is really fun. Um, He puts on some old school hip hop music for them to dance around to. The principal doesn't like it because they're shaking their butt a little bit, dancing around. Um, my other favorite scene I just mentioned, he's got to get them barking like dogs. And they're like, hoo, hoo, hoo. And he gets them all fired up. Then they learn to do like a walk in to taunt the other team. It's really fun. There's that, that, uh, walk in sign is, pr- or scene is pretty good too, because you could tell when this movie came out, it's a reference to remember the Titans. Uh, they do the, we are the Titans, the mighty, mighty but it's the lions instead. Um, there's two you mentioned earlier about how for Disney it's a surprisingly religious movie and twice in this movie there are lines that I'm like wow that's actually pretty good theology at least one for certain the other one like maybe it's just more of a preference but you you brought up the scene where it's everyone's at the rabbi's house for this dinner and they're trying to figure out like is Lamont going to be the coach? You know, can we afford this? All of that. And um, they're trying to gauge like Lamont's religious background a little bit um, because they're all Jewish or practicing Jewish people. So, you know, they're explaining like kosher laws to him as they're having this meal and whatnot. And he says something to the effect of, I never quite understood all those dietary laws but my mama always told me growing up that, you know, if you understood everything about God, you would be God. Mm-hmm. And that's actually like, it's kind of a throwaway line within the midst of the movie. Yeah. It's actually probably the most theologically accurate thing Disney has ever <laughs> produced. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. They did Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe and the Narnia movies, and those are all pretty good. So with those withstanding, like... You know, by way of Disney Channel movies, that's pretty solid. You know, that brings to mind the Stephen Curtis Chapman song, God is God and I am not. I can only see a part of the picture he's painting. Um, So I really like that line. And then there's another scene later on where it's the rabbi again and the principal lady, which you are right. It's kind of funny. We've been watching these movies for like 20 years. We don't know any of these characters' names. I, I I thought that, too, when we did the recess review. I was like, how do I not know some of these people's names? I've been watching this movie on repeat for years now. Um, but they're in the rabbi's office discussing basketball. And the principal lady is kind of the stereotypical character of, like, the, you know, the really uptight. Who's the one woman in the office? Dwight's lady friend. Um Angela. She's basically Angela, but Jewish. Mrs. Okay. Klein. Mrs. Klein. Mrs. Klein. Thank you. Um, so they're discussing like how basketball is basically like this useless thing. It's, it's just silliness. And the rabbi says, sometimes a little silliness is good for the soul. And I can't necessarily support that with scripture. Maybe if I pushed Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, there's a time and a season for all things. Maybe if I push that a little bit, I can make it work. But I think that's a good... I think there's something to that as well, of like, there is a time that being silly is not only just like fun, it's actually like it's good for you, you know, whether that's like for the Jewish people or certain Christians observing Sabbath rest and like prioritizing rest and fun during the day or, you know, not being a stick in the mud. A lot of, you know, going to like Christianity for a second, kind of a stereotype of us is that like, we're just sticks in the mud. We don't have any fun at all. And certain churches on the West coast, probably they don't have any fun. Um, there's a great meme. I got to show you after this. Um, I've been meaning to send it to dad. If that gives you a clue who this mean is about meme is about. Um, but like, that's kind of a thing. And granted, like as Christians, we don't have the same kind of fun all of the time as like the rest of the world does. 
but like there is a place for fun there's a place for silliness there's a place for as opposed to how you know christian hedonism kind of puts it if like there's a time to just go play basketball and just enjoy the good things in life a little bit any other thoughts on what i've had to say and you know what mrs klein takes his word and she gets into the basketball game she does she does yeah she does she's she stops being a stick in the mud a little bit and she's like really into that final game so I think that's it. Do you have any other thoughts on the on the movie? Okay, so with that in mind, I want to ask you a question that I've never asked you before, and we've known each other a long time now. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've been, as a family, we have been celebrating Hanukkah for almost about the same amount of time. I asked mom last year because I just didn't know. And it was right around the same time you and Brian were born, was apparently, which explains why I don't remember because I was like five or six then when this started becoming a practice for us. And I've talked about here on the show before why. And I guess if you, why my family chose to start doing this, I don't really want to get all into it right now. Um, we might. But uh, if we don't get into it and you're curious, you can always shoot us an email, email seminarylife at gmail.com. I'd be happy to explain ourselves more. Um, but this has been a part, a regular part of our family worship, our November slash December celebrations. How has celebrating Hanukkah played a part in your spiritual growth, in your holiday season in general? I mean, yeah, as the kids... Um, I think I just really enjoyed playing the game, right? Get the chocolate coins. And over time you realize this is a real story about real people who struggled. Um, like you said, the oil was only supposed to last one night and it made it eight nights. Um, and I think from a modern perspective, cause the Jewish people still celebrate it. And in fact, we see it in scripture. Jesus celebrates the festival of the lights. Um, I think for, us here in the Western culture, we can realize that uh, even though we don't necessarily hear God, we can hear him through scripture. We can listen to his voice through his living word. But even though we don't necessarily hear him, he's still providing. He's still faithful, uh, even in the midst of everything that's going on. You know, you hear of wars and rumors of wars. He's still faithful and he's going to provide for us. I like that. Yeah. You know, and you're right. Like when you're a kid, it's like the whole, we're going to play dreidel and get chocolate coins. Our family, it is traditional that each night you get a present. Our family did not do that. I think maybe when we were kids, we got like a gift or something. Um, But because we did, because we also celebrate Christmas, that's, that's where we did our presents. Now the, nights adjacent myself claire and producer cooper we do one gift at or around eight dollars we try to go for a little bit of a symbolism so just something small something kind of a token um so yeah when you're a kid it's just kind of fun um but it's a good reminder of god's faithfulness even in the darkest of times i think back to 2020 like when we got to hanukkah that was pretty nice that was pretty helpful um for me as an adult, you know, I've, I've preached about this before this part before of this is a very consuming season, not consumeristic. I guess it kind of is, but it's a very consuming time. December, you know, there's all these movies. Like we talked about, you're constantly spending money on gifts and food and baking things and cooking things. We put entire trees in our homes and run up our electric bill with lights on the outside. And we do it for fun. Like we, it's such a consuming, there's things to go do things. to, you know, kids have performances, there's stuff, right? Like it's just, there's so much and you're not going to get to all of it. But there's just so much Christmas Eve services. And then you get to Hanukkah, which kind of served as like our version, our family's version of Advent a little bit. Um, and something that I don't think I realized it as a kid, but as an adult for sure now, like it really slows everything down a little bit. Like you have Christmas, as important as Christmas is, crashing around you all of the time, 
you know, one of our local stations, for those of you outside of the Chicagoland area, there's a local radio station that starts playing Christmas music November 1st, 2nd. Like, there's been Christmas music going around here for already a month, more than a month. Um, But Hanukkah, like, makes you slow down. And it's very simple. It's very stripped down. We're going to turn off the lights. We're going to light some candles. We're going to say some blessings. Maybe sing a song. We, we sang songs as kids. Um, play dreidel. And that's it. You know, we had books as kids growing up. We've been buying producer Cooper some books. So we can like have those in the rotation too of a little bit of reading. But for the most part, it's very simple it's very stripped down and in the crashing of Christmas, it's very refreshing. I'm sure when we were kids, there were times where mom and dad would have rather have just thrown us to bed than take the five minutes to light the menorah and play a few rounds of dreidel. But for the most part, like that has been as an adult now, something that's really got me through the Christmas season of these eight nights of, okay, time to light some candles we're gonna sit here in the dark a little bit and just reflect it's very reflective i would say yeah and for me hanukkah also is a good way to continue to be thankful um like you said christmas starts november 1st around around the world or at least around the united states it's november 1st and we have thanksgiving for one day and then we jump into black friday black friday sales were starting monday before thanksgiving now um so it's like you said consumerism and you have thanksgiving and you have your day to be grateful um and then you shop 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 but i also feel like once i get to hanukkah like you said you strip down and you're reminded of things you can continue to be thankful for heading into christmas um for some reason i feel like there's one year when it was after christmas um, and it's also good to remind yourself that, hey, maybe you didn't get that great toy that you wanted. But there's also many more things that you could be thankful for that God has provided for you and your family. I really like that. I've never really considered the thankfulness aspect of it. But you are right. Again, this whole like in Chicagoland, Christmas begins the moment ha- Halloween ends. Um, it's like that episode of Bob's Burgers when Linda has the tree up in their house like midnight November 1st. Um, and, but and in Thanksgiving, as much as we like Thanksgiving, um, especially for the food, like it, it's easy to blow past it. Um, or we have now Giving Tuesday where you can, you know, after you have spent all this money on Christmas presents and also spent all this money on food, now give the nonprofits and ministries some money. Yeah, who thought of that idea? We should probably put should have put that on like the Tuesday before everything. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, but it is a good way to remain thankful, come back to being thankful, either for what you have, what you didn't get, or you know whatever it may be. It slows you down a little bit. And the purpose of having this conversation is not. You know, my seminary life is not here to make you go to seminary. It's here to encourage you to pursue God intellectually. That is a good thing. Similarly, we're not here necessarily as two Christians making you feel, you shouldn't feel like you have to celebrate Hanukkah. That's not the point. This is just to bring you in a little bit into our festivities, our lifestyle a little bit, and also have a conversation about thankfulness, about miracles, about God's faithfulness. Like these are all great things that as Christians, we can also definitely get behind. Any last thoughts from you? All right. Well, if that's the case, then thank you for taking a time out of your evening to come hang out with me and record this episode. And thank you all for being a part of our Hanukkah celebrations a little bit with this episode. If you haven't yet already, please consider reading or reviewing the show wherever you get your podcasts. Pass this episode along to somebody who you think will enjoy it. If you would like to financially support the show, you can head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash mslpod. You can make a one-time donation. You can head on over to our wish list and donate towards getting me a new laptop because I don't know how much longer this one's going to hang in there. 
Or you can join one of our support tiers, monthly support tiers. Everyone who supports the show at $9 a month gets a shout out. So thank you, Lori, for supporting the show. Next week, we've got the 2023 holiday party. And like I said, it's going to be like an actual party. We have, I'm planning on several people being here, and we're going to be discussing the most popular holidays in the United States. We've got a top 10 list. Apparently, this is like statistically proven census data thing. And it's a little interesting in certain parts, but we're going to get into it more next week. But as always, this is Brandon signing off, reminding you that theology is for everybody. So keep on studying.